wait, I know you clicked on this video, you're looking at the length of the video and all the different time codes and you're getting pretty uh, intimidated, I guess it would be the right word. But don't worry, while honestly the breadth of features and capabilities of the RetroTank 4K was completely overwhelming, uh, which is why this video has taken so long, a lot of why this thing is so good can and, and everything you want from it can basically be had through plug and play capability. I'm gonna make it easy for you right at the start before we get in deep. And I'll have thorough time codes linked below along with some other goodies. You're paying a lot of money for this thing and it respects that. All right, let's roll into it. While you're upgrading to the ultimate video scaler, upgrade to the ultimate AI and analytics assistant for your YouTube channel with this video's sponsor, TubeBuddy. I've used TubeBuddy for more than eight years now and it gets better every year. With it, you get an AI-powered helper to allow you to brainstorm the best performing content for your audience, plan out new shorts to get more views, A-B test titles and thumbnails to improve your click-through rates, and track your performance and SEO all to grow your channel. Earning more is just a click away as TubeBuddy helps you optimize your viewer retention and get more views, thus increasing your ad revenue and how much you can earn from sponsors. In case you missed the deal last time, we've got you with a new one. Get 30% off TubeBuddy with code EPOSVOX30 at the link below. It is a rare moment in my career that I actually get to see someone make the dream device in a given category with no holds barred. I have pushed so many manufacturers to make the, you know, such ultimate devices to be okay selling something more expensive if it means earning lifetime customers and community support for the very obvious, if smaller, market of enthusiasts such as a DisplayPort capable adaptive sync capture card, for example. And it almost never happens. But after years of saying that so many feature requests were impossible on the RetroTINK 5X, then pulling them off anyway, Mike Chi has decided to give the community just that. The ultimate scaler. A juggernaut to transform any video source you can imagine. Retro game systems, old movies, VHS tapes, old camcorders, vintage computers, and even modern HD sources like the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 into beautifully crisp 4K video ready for the modern age for top tier captures or displaying on your 4K TV. The RetroTINK 4K takes just about every dream you've ever had for an upscaling device and makes it a reality. It goes toe to toe with broadcast industry scalers that cost thousands of dollars while offering signal compatibility and flexibility that those scalers could only dream of. This is a once-in-a-lifetime tier product, the likes of which we may never see again. A device so loaded with flexibility, capability, features, and support that even just categorizing it as a 4K scaler undersells it by a country mile. It's a scaler, image processor, HDR and SDR transcoder, frame rate and size manipulator, deinterlacer, so much. It can automatically crop missized sources. It can deinterlace messy PS2 signals better than any device before it. It can make laser discs and VHS tapes look better than you could possibly imagine. It can work with virtually any composite S video component, SCART, VGA, or HDMI device on the planet. Hell, it could give you a microscopic look into the sphincter of every pixel if you wanted. The RetroTINK 4K can accomplish a multitude of tasks beyond my wildest expectations and more than I could possibly cover in one video. But despite all that, I'll try to do it justice in today's episode. But first, I just want to say thanks to Mike Chi for being a great member of the retro community. In the face of constant knockoffs, stealing his designs, cloners undercutting his prices, and outright attacks from the competition. You a real one. Enough fluff, let's play some games and movies. I'm excited. The unit I have here was an earlier prototype with a non-final chassis, but the final product will look close enough to this as seen in the photos. The RetroTINK 4K resembles the XRGB Mini FrameMeister in many ways through its design. The front features composite and S-Video inputs with audio hidden behind a sliding door to keep dust out and a full-size SD card slot. A SCART Jack lines the right side with component video, 3.5 millimeter audio, optical toss link audio, VGA, and HDMI input on the back, along with HDMI output and USB-C for power, plus a reset button. This 
is loaded. I do wish the device was like twice as thick so all inputs could be on the back side as while having plugs in all sides of the scaler looks kind of neat in thumbnails, trying to neatly route that on an entertainment system sucks. Plus splitters could be built in then, but that's asking a little much and we can source our own splitters, I suppose. The only detractor for the IO capabilities of this thing is that we are limited to HDMI 2.0 here. So the 4K60 output and it's missing any HDMI 2.1 specific features such as going higher than 60 Hertz for black frame insertion at 4K or 1440p 240 Hertz. Again, that's asking a lot. The HDMI 2.1 chips are just too expensive and would have made this already expensive device absurdly priced. Maybe we can see a midlife upgrade in a year or two when the chips get cheaper or something like that. The RetroTINK 4K Pro? Instead of trying to list and evaluate every feature in this behemoth, let's just focus on use cases. Here is a menu somewhere here with time codes of said different use cases so you can jump to what's relevant to you or watch all the way through if you want, you know, if you like my work and you want to convince the retention algorithm gods that my video is worth surfacing to new viewers. First up is the obvious. I have retro game consoles with analog video connections and I want to play them on my fancy 4K TV. As Bob from RetroRGB covered in this awesome beginner's video as to why we want scalers for retro consoles, your TV likely doesn't have analog inputs. And if it does, it's going to handle the signal very poorly, resulting in blurry and laggy video. With this, you plug your console in using composite, S-video, SCART, or component, and turn everything on. HDMI goes out to your TV. USB is the power input. Turn on the RetroTINK 4K. The menus are loaded with anything and everything you could want to do with your video signal. But it's also super simple. Don't get freaked out. It can be plug and play. Just hit the input button on your remote and choose your input. Let's say YPBPR for component video for my PlayStation 2 here for this demo. 4K60 is the default output format and what the RetroTINK 4K is, you know, built for. So I'd leave it at that. But you can choose other output resolutions like 1080p and 1440p if you wish to use with the output button. The CRT effects won't work as great there. For basic gameplay, this is all, literally all you need. By default, you're getting a clear, mostly sharp signal for your 4K TV or capture to play and enjoy. That's all you need to do. It's breathtaking. You're breathtaking. I mean, look at the footage. How could you not be impressed? But if you want to make sure you're optimized for your specific signal, you can do that too, with just a couple presses. To demo this, let's actually switch to the Super Nintendo and peep some pixels. Previously, with devices like the OSSC, Open Source Can Converter, or Data Path Capture Cards, you had to be a rocket scientist to figure out the precise resolution and phase calculations and all this stuff for your specific system and even the specific game on that system and a bunch of other wacky stuff that I never wanted to bother with and I'm a nerd. But the RetroTINK 4K comes pre-packed with amazing and fine-tuned profiles on the SD card from Firebrand X and Wobbling Pixels, among others. Hit the profile button on the remote. You can choose from the shipped profiles with the RetroTINK 4K, or you can download profiles from the community wiki on your computer and pop them on the SD card, or just get them from other users to add to this lot. Hit load from file and find the system you want to use. I'll go to Nintendo SNES and choose Wobbling Pixels SNES Sharp and hit OK. Again, you can proceed using this as is, but for best results, it's also worth hitting the auto gain and auto phase buttons on your remote. Let each of them process before you hit the next one. These are some of those complex calculations for the best signal interpretation and best brightness levels and such like that that RetroTINK 4K can just do automatically for you. Run auto gain, wait for it. Run auto phase, wait for it to finish and then hit the profile button again and save this profile in place over the existing one so that all of this information for your specific game console is dialed in and saved. The magic here is in the auto sampling capabilities. These profiles have virtually every resolution for specific consoles mapped to them and it auto detects them and adjusts settings perfectly. You don't have to manually juggle profiles for games that switch between 480i and 240p anymore and the optimal settings are just kind of applied for you. Speaking of 480i switching, the RetroTINK 5X already made these games more or less a non-issue where other scalers would often lose sync for a minute when switching formats, but the 4K does this even faster and lets you have more optimal settings for menus in a game at 480i versus the game itself being 240p and so on. It's wild. 480i games are something I absolutely prefer using the RetroTINK 4K and my OLED TV over my BVM for, 
as 480i flicker on a high line count CRT is really exhausting on the eyes. I'm far from the best choice to teach you all the complexities and math behind video signal sampling and phase, but here's a brief overview. Analog audio and video signals are just that, electrical signals. They are constantly running, typically at a rate defined by the power standards in your room. So 60 hertz for the NTSC region of North America, 50 hertz for PAL regions in Europe. Think of it like, you know, a sine wave running at a specific speed. But signals don't often stick to that exact spec. Traditionally, video runs at 59.94 Hz instead of straight 60. This is to leave room for audio and some complexity with sending color versus black and white video. From there, different game systems often send at ever so slightly different rates too, such as 59.98 Hz or the 60.01 Hz the Super Nintendo is notorious for doing. And by nature of analog video, each individual unit could have even smaller fluctuations on top of that, beyond, you know, the, the default change in rate. CRT televisions did not care about this. The range at which they could accept and tolerate signal fluctuations was massive, and they just delivered the signal to you, mostly without issue. But converting that to digital requires sampling, taking samples of, you know, checking at certain points in time that signal over time to map out to a more concrete digital rate. With video signals, there are different horizontal and vertical sampling rates. The vertical sampling rate is easy enough to determine. That is virtually always 480 alternating lines for 480i or 240 consistent lines for 240p content. But horizontally, there's no end of possible horizontal resolutions that can output to a CRT with varying degrees of clarity from those resolutions. There is an end, but it's a lot. The OSSC, the Open Source Scan Converter Wiki, provides some examples of the sampling formats required for different systems, but different games on each system might run at a different horizontal resolution as well. On devices like that OSSC or Datapath capture cards, you're basically required to figure out that on a game-by-game -game basis to best dial in your settings for a sharp result. But with the RetroTink 4K, you have an auto sampling button for it to just automatically determine the correct sampling rate and phase, basically the direction of the pixels to sample in, alongside an auto gain button to determine if the analog to digital converters need any additional gain to get the cleanest and best signal from your system. This is basically pure magic. The initial steps are easy to get great scaling, but you run into another frustration I had with similar scalers like the FrameMeister OSSC and such, which was juggling profiles as someone who likes playing all the consoles, it's usually unwieldy. That's a lot of profiles. And then there's some systems like the PS2 and Xbox that have games in widescreen and 4x3 to deal with, with separate profiles, and so on. The badass remote for the RetroTINK 4K makes this easy. You have 12 numbered programmable buttons that you can assign profiles to, so you can immediately hop between them whenever you switch profiles. Amazing. Another step you could introduce to clean up 30 FPS 480i games even more, a bunch of games are like this on PS2, uh, but I imagine Xbox and GameCube might have a couple of these too. In the film mode settings, there's an inverse telecine option. Traditionally, this is a tool used to deinterlace 24 FPS movies in a 60 hertz video signal using the three to two cadence, where one frame is displayed three times, the next one is two times, back to three, and so on to pace 24 FPS films properly. I cover this a bit more later in the video section, but it can also be used here. There's another mode, a two by two mode, that will rebuild proper progressive output from a locked or stable 30 FPS 480i video feed, which creates a much more clear feed than the normal motion adaptive view interlacing when it's working right. This requires a little bit more research on your part. For example, I learned that Silent Hill 3 apparently does this, so I was testing it there, but I couldn't really tell if it was working right. There are other games like Aeon Flux, which just completely destroy it, but you need to know specifically which games run at 480i only and 30 FPS only, but it can produce the best looking results you're gonna get for those games. In this house, we don't shame video connections. Component video is great. I love my HD RetroVision cables as much as the next gal, but you might not want to fork out for them, and a good quality S video cable already provides such a leap over composite that RGB modded systems and bougie component cables aren't worth it for most people. And that's fine. The RetroTINK 4K supports composite and S video, and those look great too. They're inherently a bit more noisy than component or RGB, but you still get some solid results. And if you combine them with some of the consumer CRT mask options, you get pretty accurate. That's just how I remember it looking results too which is awesome.
that feeling is always great. One thing that the RetroTINK 4K cannot fix is if your game console itself is screen tearing. Some people were somehow expecting this from the VRR output or something. For example, God of War 2 on the PlayStation 2 constantly tears during gameplay, and I even had a couple running Gran Turismo 4 on PS2 in 1080i. That screen tearing is rendered to the frame that is given to the RetroTINK. You can't force the PS2 to output <laughs> FreeSync or something. You can't do anything about that, so just... VRR is to prevent tearing from a, a, a source that is generating variable refresh rate frames, but doesn't do anything when you're already given static frames and upscaling them, just, just to be clear. If you already HDMI modded your system or are using one of the many recent HDMI output adapters for your game console, these see a ton of benefit here as well. The HDMI input on here is perfect for 480p HDMI mods, but does offer some unique benefits for 720p and 1080p systems as well. The very first thing I even tried when I got my RetroTINK 4K was the Eon XBHD. Running games through it to get clean 480p when scaling to 4K in the RetroTINK looks absolutely amazing on my LG CX. I was blown away. The original Xbox has never looked this good. Similarly, the Retro Gym on my PlayStation 2 bypasses the typically noisy video output of my favorite game console and gives you the cleanest digital video output possible. Despite the unnecessary drama between Pixel FX and RetroTINK, it's perfect for feeding into the RetroTINK 4K and pushing up to 4K resolution, bypassing the need to even get the shiny edition upgrade for the Retro Gym. 480i or 480p output is all you need to get full benefits from the RetroTINK. So that saves you some money there if you haven't bought it already. The PS2 profiles on board work great here. You just gotta swap the input to HDMI. If you are using the analog inputs instead for your PlayStation 2, then you can use the auto crop features, which are handily mapped to aux one through three on your remote to crop the weirdly framed four by three and 16 by nine games on the system. And if you're using the retro gym for this, since that's the point of this section, you can still use the scaling menu to custom scale and fit your frame to fill your 16 by nine canvas for those widescreen games. Gone are the days of PS2 games with letter boxing and pillar boxing on your display. I hated that so much and it's gone. The PS2 has never looked this beautiful and clean and it will probably never look any better again. If you don't have the GameCube component cables, the Carby or the GCHD HDMI outputs work perfectly here too. You could also use the Eon Super 64 to go from your Nintendo 64 to the RetroTINK 4K, but since it only uses S-Video outputs on, on the Super 64, unless you haven't gotten your hands on high quality S-Video cables for your N64 yet, or any of your previous Nintendo consoles, there's no real benefit. The GBA Consoleizer 720p output is crisp and perfect for scaling to 4K for your Game Boy gaming goodness, or to better emulate scan lines and the LCD effects by pre-scaling back down to 240p with a 1 4th pre-scale decimator setting. I have some profiles I made for this linked below. Analogs FPGA systems like the Super NT Mini also work here similarly by outputting 720p or 1080p over HDMI, or the launch firmware for the RetroTINK 4K gives you an option to interface with the 240p digital output of Analog's consoles in place of the Analog DAC, which is pretty wild. So you just get the native 240p that you can scale and apply effects to. 
These kinds of systems work best with that prescale feature that lets you skip lines on the input signal to take already upscaled signals back down to their lower resolutions to more accurately upscale, apply those CRT effects, or even correct improper aspect ratios on some of the emulation consoles. It's a really neat effect, but Try over at My Life in Gaming has already made an entire video on this process, so I point you to his wonderful video on this and save us both some time. Or maybe cost you some time if you weren't plan on planning on watching that before. RetroTINK 4K also has some benefits it can offer when scaling modern HD sources to 4K too. I wanted to first note that this HDMI input is basically only an HDMI 1.4B spec port, designed for up to 1080p input, so you won't be able to pass through 4K consoles, or in fact anything in 1440p. The 1440p output from the PS2 RetroJump caused all sorts of issues with it too. Scaling your 720p and 1080p consoles is dead simple. Plug them to the HDMI input slot and change the input on the RetroTINK to HDMI. Out of the box, that's all you really need. You could reduce the sharpness of the scaling if you don't like the consequences of sharper pixels on your TV, but I think sitting at a distance just about anyone would prefer it left on sharp scaling to the other modes. Maybe try by Cubic. This looks great for most HDMI games, though if you wanted to play with CRT emulation to add a little texture, it can absolutely help cover up some of the gnarly aliasing on plenty of games, even more modern ones. There's no real magic here. It just scales them up with, you know, better algorithms than your TV would and lets you add a tad bit of sharpness if you don't like how your TV does it. I'll cover some alternative devices that can do the same thing for 1080p era consoles at the end of the video. Up close and in video, there probably isn't going to be too convincing of a result uh, as necessary. I can already upscale the 1080p footage to 4K to make in my video editor to make it look as nice as 4K, uh, but sitting at a distance from your TV and gaming on the couch or something, the added clarity and sharpness from this kind of upscale really helps visibility when you're playing your older games on your 4K TV. Sure, the Xbox Series X can play some Xbox and Xbox 360 games at 4K, but backwards compatibility is not 100%, and there's a lot of PS3 games still stuck on the PS3. This feature is not a primary selling point of the RetroTINK 4K, but it is a nice feature if you're already using it. It is important to note that the PlayStation 3's HDCP, or copy protection that prevents capture cards from working, is preserved here on the RetroTINK. Disabling it would put RetroTINK's creator at massive risk of lawsuits that he shouldn't have to deal with, so instead just get an HDMI splitter. This View HD one I've been re using and recommending since 2014 is like $20 and bypasses the HDCP on the PS3 without issue. Don't even have to do anything. Or if you have multiple HDMI consoles anyway, consider grabbing one of these Ezku HDMI matrix boxes. I've covered them in the past. They're a switch and a splitter in one. And if you hold the output one button switch for three seconds, the lights flash and then it bypasses HDCP. Easy peasy. HDCP does not keep you from capturing component video from the PS3, but just make sure you have good component cables for that, which will cost as much as a splitter or more anyway. Both of these essentials are linked in the description below and can be easily USB powered with a USB to barrel jack cable due to them only needing two volts. I was hoping one of these little EDIE, EDID cloners, you know, cheap Chinese HDMI devices, usually these break HDCP, and I figured it might be a smaller way to do so with PlayStation 3 or whatever other source. Uh, it's not. Uh, I, I obviously haven't tried every single one. I have a few different ones of these that I use for like my servers and my computers that I need to have headless where I don't have a monitor attached or to get plug into an iGPU to get GPU encoding on an iGPU without a monitor attached. These are great for that, but they don't seem to do anything for the PlayStation 3. Instead, instead of even showing the HDCP, it just shows a black screen, which I think means it's just trying to pass through 4K, even though the P PS3 is only outputting 1080p. So this is not a solution, unfortunately. A few different scaling modes are available here in the RetroTINK 4K. The default is bilinear sharp, which uses integer or nearest neighbor scaling to go to the closest integer scale, and then uses bilinear to interpolate the rest of the way to the final output size. This gives you the sharpest possible pixels and no shimmering when you're not perfectly integer. Bilinear medium scales the image 2x with nearest neighbor and then bilinear the rest of the way. It's softer than bilinear sharp, but sharper than most other, you know, standard bilinear scales. Bilinear standard just uses normal bilinear scaling, which is your basic average scale you'd see in most applications or TVs. It's fast, but not particularly sharp. 
Bilinear Soft basically scales based on half of the original resolution for its inter interpolation, which creates a soft image, a very soft image. This is usually used on the horizontal axis for CRT emulation effects. Cubic uses bicubic scaling, which tends to be sharper than traditional bilinear scaling, but wouldn't be as sharp as nearest neighbor, and lacks the sharpening added by Lanxos scaling. This is more useful for scaling up 3D mo or modern stuff to look sharp without emphasizing the jagged pixels quite as much. Lanxos 2 and Lanxos 3 are using the Lanxos algorithms, which tend to add a bunch of sharpening during the scaling process. This can look good for live action video or some 3D games, but tends to add some artifacting from the over sharpening effects, such as ringing or white highlight around the edges. Thankfully, the RetroTINK 4K also gives you an anti-ringing option, which seems to help mitigate this. It's safe to leave on, and it's on by default, as it only really kicks in when the Lanxos options are selected anyway. The last scaling option is None, which only uses nearest neighbor. This can result in shimmering or weird sizing if you're not scaling to an exact integer scale, like 200 or 300%. The RetroTINK 4K also has options for trimming the blank space from your input signal, with the auto crop buttons for 4x3 and 16x9 output as well for certain signals. There's also the Rotate mode, which rotates for vertical games like shoot 'em ups I don't have any of these to test, but people have been testing it. It's pretty neat. Aspect ratio correction also is also present to help you squish and fill your video how you're expecting it to look. Useful for clone consoles and mini consoles or whatever that don't aspect, you know, output the correct aspect ratio. You really have just about complete control over every aspect, pun intended, of your image on this device. And I am impressed at how user friendly it is overall. Sure, there's a lot of options, and you probably have to learn a few things and experiment a bit. But the granularity here, while still being just kind of normal-ish human speak options, rather than, you know, a lot of math and deeper tweaking, pretty awesome. Honestly, the best part of working on my review for the RetroTINK 4K has been discovering so many ways that I've wanted to play games that I didn't really consider viable anymore, or that are now just awesome to use with the scaler. For years, I wanted to use my vintage computer stuff in videos a lot more than I do. Windows XP runs through my bloodstream, and a lifetime ago, I bit, built a nice early 2000s aesthetic PC to run all my favorite XP era games maxed out. Plus, I restored my childhood Windows 98 gateway with a Voodoo 3 and want to play even older games natively there too. While I have CRT PC monitors that I adore, I can't always justify fitting them on my desk with everything else. And even when I do, trying to capture VGA PC footage is nothing short of a nightmare. At least, prior to the RetroTINK 4K. VGA, EGA, CGA, 70 Hz, 320 by 200, 640 by 480, 800 by 600. There's so many format changes and mixed display standards that can happen even within a single game, such as with Epic Pinball, that a CRT monitor handles without you even realizing, most of the time. But scalers and capture hardware basically fall over when you try to coax them into it. The RetroTINK makes this mostly seamless. Seeing my Windows 98 desktop perfectly scaled to my 4K OLED without an ounce of blur was a glorious thing to behold. Beyond gaming, my style and video design constantly relies on using my older technology, and I want to represent it in a way that keeps up with modern standards. And I have always hated how capturing these older desktops looked. Until now. Even old BIOS screens, which constantly switch formats, are kept up with, synced immediately, and more or less captured beautifully. Sometimes a little cropped. Seeing Duke Nukem 3D running a 320 by 200 auto crop to proper 4x3 and sharply upscaled was amazing. 640x480 is pretty solid too. Doesn't matter if I'm running games in DOS 70Hz modes, which the RetroTINK has a supported input mapping for, even in the OSD, it reads DOS 70Hz as an input format. In 3DFX renderers, Direct3D, they all just map out wonderfully. The only real issue I'm running into with capturing vintage PC signals over VGA right now has to do with games like Epic Pinball, which are constantly switching formats. This requires me to hit the autocrop buttons every time it changes to keep the framing correct. The RetroTINK 4K does not have an always-on autocrop, as that would cause all kinds of nightmares for cutscenes and games that just have dark sides and so on. Having to hit the buttons, which are all mapped to aux 1 through aux 3 on the remote for convenience, is not a big deal for just, you know, playing games, but for capture, not great having to readjust. 
To be fair, most newer-ish PC CRT monitors, you had to readjust the frame sizing when formats were changed a lot anyway, so that's at least realistic to the experience, I guess. This can theoretically be fixed with a custom from profile, uh, mapping each of those custom resolutions and their crops to one profile with like sub resolutions. But at the time of writing this video, I've not quite figured out how to set that up. I've just been told it's possible. Once I do, I shall probably release a profile and add it to the description. I've had issues trying to pass through the native 70 hertz to my OLED. You can't do this at 4K as the 4K output is limited to 60 hertz. I tried dropping to 1440p 100 hertz and using VRR and frame lock issues and it had some weird issues in pacing 70 hertz to 100 hertz didn't really work, but uh, Dubzenhauer? on Twitter clearly got it working. Clear, it seems like 1440p60 VRR and frame sync is the way to go there. But with games that swap around a lot, your display might have some issues constantly adjusting to those new formats. Your mileage may vary. I, I, I think the way to go is to just use the frame buffer at 60 hertz. Running 800 by 600 and 1024 by 768 on my Windows XP rig works perfectly too. Though I had trouble pushing something like 100 hertz at these resolutions, which is how I would normally play on a CRT. But again, I'll keep testing. This is something that we should expand on in the future. Part of the image processing pipeline with this scaler means you'll be able to apply some neat effects to your video feed. First is scan lines. Unlike most competing products, the RetroTink 4K doesn't just use a scan line PNG overlaid on the video. Instead, it actually generates scan lines to alternate within the lines of the video signal. There's five different pattern types which affect the way the li lines themselves are generated, as well as how sharp or smooth they transition from the bright to dark areas. Then you have strength controls, which is kind of like opacity, and then modulation, which effectively changes the thickness of the scan lines. This can look neat on its own, but can be combined with a couple other effects to look even better. First is a special deinterlacing mode. So let's talk about that deinterlacing menu for a sec. Hit menu, advanced, and then settings, and then deinterlace slash film mode setup. Here you can choose different deinterlacing modes for taking 480i or even 1080i content that is interlaced and converting it back to progressive scan. The first is the default motion adaptive deinterlacing mode. This has been all the rage ever since the frame meister uh, was you know popular and typically produces uh, the best results the easiest as it determines which deinterlacing models should be used for movement versus still parts of the image and adjust them on the fly sometimes artifacts can be seen which is very common in tekken 3 on the playstation 1 but it's a way better experience than just leaving bob or weave on most of the time there's a bunch of tuning settings for it eventually too if Hopefully people will develop better profiles for certain games or whatever. Then there's the other ways of deinterlacing, such as Bob, which just doubles the height of both fields, and then it bounces up and down. Weave, which just blends both fields together and looks very comb-y. Linear, which is Bob, but linearly interpolated, so some lines get averaged together. And then Blend, which just blends the two fields together and looks blurry and ghosty. But there is a new deinterlacing mode called CRT Simulation. This one is similar to Bob, but changes the scanline behavior to match how they would look on a real CRT TV. This requires scanlines to be enabled, or it will just do Bob deinterlacing, but combined with those scanlines we talked about, ends up looking far more convincing for 480i content. This does require you to match the refresh rate output of your content, for example, 50 hertz for PAL content, or it won't look correct. And you may need to turn off the frame buffer output, or else you'll get a frame ju jump every once in a while, but it may not bother you. The next effect you might want to combine with the scanline effects is HDR conversion. The big problem with using scanline effects with TVs like this is the massive drop in brightness due to covering the screen in a lot of darkness. In the output settings, you can enable HDR output. This tone maps your signal to HDR to engage the HDR mode on your TV, giving you much more dynamic range and possible brightness, making the game far more visible and getting a lot closer to that CRT experience, in my opinion. I honestly thought it was gimmicky at first, but I love it. It's how I created my VHS profiles I talk about elsewhere in the video. Even in my first CRT-related videos on my YouTube channels, I talk about how HDR is the only way we'd be able to imitate the perceived depth of a CRT image. Here we are. You can tweak the brightness in the SMT SMPTE2084 settings under color correction, and then you can play around to get the look that you want. This is especially valuable with the other kind of effect you can generate, which are CRT masks themselves. They're not just limited to scan line generation, but you can generate entire faux masks of CRT tubes themselves. And the ones we have are just like placeholder, kind of Mike just threw them together 
kind of masks. I think people are going to generate a lot better ones moving forward, but I, I really dig the ones we have now. There's already profiles for slot mask and aperture grill tubes, but I know the community is already hard at work making profiles specifically to emulate specific CRTs. I did a macro shot compared to my 37 inch slot mask tube here compared to my OLED running the slot mask profile. And the pixel density between these two shots is insane. This is a macro lens at 8K, uh, 100 millimeter macro lens, one to one. And I punched it in on the CRT and then I did the same on my 4K OLED with slot mask enabled. And <laughs> I had to zoom in the CRT two times to get the size you're seeing. I had to zoom in the 4K OLED shot 10 times and we're still not even close in size. That's how dense the pixels on these 4K screens are and why it was required for these mass simulations. So I can't wait to see what people make next. There's a few mono options, which are the traditional way of doing this kind of mask format, uh, which is just drawing more lines over the image. But thanks to the 4K output resolution of the RetroTINK 4K here, there's enough pixel, pixel density to generate the full RGB masks, emulating the RGB phosphors and subpixels of the screen, coming very, very close to the real thing. This is crazy. These can be combined with scan lines if you wish to kind of further emulate the proper experience. When using either of these masking tools, you may want to play around with horizontally blurring your image to better simulate the analog video and blend better with the masks. You also have color bleed controls for different red and blue channels to emulate some of the common CRT degradations you would see. You can also emulate an LCD screen if you want. The mono option puts a one by one pixel border around every upscaled pixel. The RGB option simulates RGB subpixels, kind of like the CRT phosphor ones. I would like to see a, a, an empty one by one pixel alignment to emulate older Game Boy screens and things like that. There's strength options for these. It, it's a cool effect. It can be used to, like I said, with systems like Game Boy to further, or PSP, to further emulate those screens better. But I do think we need a couple more options for that. Lastly, the RetroTINK 4K can create black frame insertion for you if your TV doesn't support it. BFI improves motion clarity, one of the biggest dividing qualities that makes CRTs superior to modern displays. As I covered in my latest CRT video last year up here, this happens by inserting a solid black frame between each new frame of video, effectively resetting each pixel or LCD structure so that there's less or no added ghosting or motion blur from the usual ways that modern TVs sample and hold and then flip to between frames. This is mostly a band-aid on LCD panels, but on OLED, it basically brings it in line with CRTs in terms of motion clarity. It's not perfectly clear as the CRT is, but it is so close that most people won't care anymore. Unfortunately, not all TVs have a BFI mode. My LG CX over here does, but as John from Digital Foundry has been observing, newer LG TVs seem to have less gaming features exposed like this over time, which is kind of disappointing. It's always better to use your TV's BFI mode if that's an option, and some TV's auto dimming options will freak out from the RetroTINK's BFI signal. But if your TV doesn't have it, you can try enabling it here. This requires setting the output to 1440p or lower due to not having that HDMI 2.1 bandwidth for 4K 120, and then 100 hertz or 120 hertz for 50 hertz or 60 hertz formats, respectively. Then you need to turn on gen lock or frame sync mode instead of the triple buffer output mode. Then you can enable BFI in the settings and get settings for strobe and blur, which change the rate at which a black frame is shown on screen and how long your original frame is displayed. If you're connecting to a 1080p 240 or a 720p 360 hertz display, you could set up custom BFI modes to leverage that, according to Blurbusters but 120 hertz is probably the best and easiest for most. Overall, this can seriously help improve motion clarity and reduce latency, all bringing you know, your, your fancy TV basically right up against the CRT in terms of usability. CRTs are no longer a must for gaming anymore. It's impressive. Synth Rock Expansion Packs 1 and 2, now available on USB cassette tapes. Get a piece of backing track that tethers our classic roots to our modern streaming world, and get music to use in your streams and videos. Support our free music project by picking up a set for yourself, and get some free bootleg button pins with your order at glitch.mov slash synthrock. The RetroTINK 4K unlocks an entire new world of gaming, one that has been eye-opening and honestly life-changing enough that I'm heavily considering tearing down my BVM D24 gaming setup and just stacking my consoles next to my desk with my OLED and my big 36 inch CRT to game on, relying primarily on the RetroTINK 4K instead. 
As a lifelong CRT enthusiast, I am starting to get swayed, believe it or not. I still want my big CRT for playing certain 4x3 games a certain way, and the RetroTink can't make light gun games work, but I'm starting to be converted. I'm not even sure I want an FW900 anymore. <laughs> this feels like a spiritual awakening that I wasn't ready for. A good chunk of my entire studio might change based on purely this one device. I'll still have CRTs for my glitch art and general fun. I still love them, but I'm thinking a RetroTink and OLED might be the future for my gaming. We can't spend too long looking to the future yet. I'm not quite done wrangling the past. Beyond gaming, there's also some pretty game-changing uses for this scaler that has me considering buying at least one more to solely use for work. Let's upscale some video. Look at this. I've created some pretty rad profiles for VHS and Hi8 tapes that replicate the experience of playing them on my 37-inch CRT I have next to my desk. As much as I love my skills and tools for digitizing analog tapes, I rarely like how they look upscaled in post. The algorithms, even in programs like StaxRip with VaporSynth, just never recreate the way I feel they provide blown up on a CRT. But upscaling that analog signal before capture? It's glorious. I had already committed a second RetroTINK 5X to my analog video art section of my studio for capturing my VHS tapes and glitch art and archives and all of that, but the RetroTINK 4K takes this to the next level with finer controls over signal integrity, chroma and luminance levels, and so on. I can now inverse telecine deinterlace 24 FPS tapes so they don't judder. I can tune the signal properly so even noisy VCRs don't show gray for blacks anymore and tune the scan line and mask generators to give a texture to help kind of boost the sharpness a little bit while masking noise in the tapes. The telecine mode samples 24 FPS from 60 Hertz signals properly with the three by two cadence used in most films with auto detect functionality to detect the right timings for this so you don't have juttery playback. It's still a work in progress as I understand it, but it's absolutely rad and a game changer for VHS and Laserdisc captures. I will say some of my tapes, if I direct connect to VCR, it will sometimes kind of not stay in sync with the telecine mode. I have had better lucks running it through my tapes through a secondary box that deinterlaces them, a, a unit I will talk about in a moment with a time-based corrector. But even as it is out of the box is amazing and they're working on additional time-based corrector functionality for the firmware, I believe, which is crazy. This feature is contributed by Blur Busters, which is pretty neat. I've built separate SDR and HDR profiles for the tapes. I prefer how they look in HDR mode with uh, the masks turned on, though sometimes colors can get clipped in weird ways, though I've done my best to tune for this. But overall, the range boost provided by HDR, along with the masks cutting across, it finally feels like I'm sitting in front of the warm glow of a tube again on an OLED. My profiles here utilize the CRT emulation for texture and sharpness and masking noise. Not everyone will want to use CRT emulation, so you could turn those off and save over the profiles, but I definitely think it helps a lot, and I'll have separate... Uh, I'll be improving these over time and put download links in the description. I will have separate playback and capture profiles available, uh, as the masks don't always scale well. Scale, scale well for capture. That is really hard to say. Scale well. This has the benefit of both making your viewing experience of these classic movies more enjoyable and authentic and making old captures look way better than is easily done after the fact digitally. For archival purposes, it's still best practice to capture the raw 480i YUY2 copy of your tapes or use something like the Domesday Project to capture all the raw RF bits. But when it comes to actually watching or working with these results in production, I'm going with the RetroTINK 4K every time. It is worth noting that the RetroTINK 4K is very stable compared to other scalers at interpreting VHS tape signals, which tend to be incredibly unstable as a magnetic tape medium, but it does not have a full time-based corrector built in, like I mentioned. 
though they're working on that. A TBC is used to keep the chroma or color and luma or brightness signals coming in at the same time in sync, which helps with a lot of the frame bouncing, random glitches and entire frame drops that can happen through composite video or even S video for a tape. Hell, my SVHS deck can't even really be captured without a TBC as it loses sync with most capture options. High-end TBCs are incredibly expensive and inaccessible. If capturing VHS tapes is a priority for you, I'd recommend picking up some of the old Panasonic DVD recorder boxes. Typically the DMR ES10 or DMR ES15 models, though there are others. These have wonderful TBCs built in and you can pass your VCR through it and then output composite S video or component to the RetroTINK to play back or capture. The DMR unit can even deinterlace for you if you want. And like I said, in my testing, it does a perfect job. So I just kind of let it handle the deinterlacing and then upscale with the RetroTINK. For my OLED profile demos here, I was not using one of these, but for all of my straight VHS captures, I use a DMR ES10 as the difference on older and degraded tapes is kind of night and day. I'll include some profiles too with this in mind. Since I frequently use my RetroTINK 5X for capturing my analog video glitch art, I figured I'd see how the 4K handles that workflow. Coming out of my Panasonic DMR as a time-based corrector, it seems to slot in fine, giving me native 4K captures instead of 1440p max, and allows me to use my VHS profiles with the cool CRT emulation. Beyond that, there's nothing super special here. Despite crazy glitching, the signal stays stable. If I remove the TBC from the chain, the 4K holds up surprisingly well, keeping sync overall, but it's constantly showing the on-screen display as if the input was changing like an old TV, which I would not want in my captures and is a bit annoying, and it tends to lose the color values more quickly than a CRT would. While the result is impressive at how well it tries to keep the signal, it doesn't even compare to the raw output of a CRT TV, so it doesn't replace tubes for me here. But that's totally okay. Another use I have for upscaling and CRT emulation on the RetroTINK 4K is for blocky compressed videos. I noted in my video about HD CRTs back in the day that I loved watching Twitch streams on them as you don't really notice the blocky compression, which was way worse back in 2017, on those kinds of screens. Well, you can kind of emulate this with a mono slot mask and scanline emulation here with one of these softer scaling methods. The softer scaling takes the edge off of macro blocking and the CRT emulation helps add perceived sharpness and mask out other compression artifacts. For this, I set my HDMI output from a computer to 720p, connected HDMI to the RetroTINK and played back the video full screen with nothing showing over top, of course. It's not for everyone, but for a stylized look that does better than this video has been compressed 10 times before seeing it in my video, I love it. I could talk for days about how excited I am for the RetroTINK 4K, with Mike having spent basically all of 2023 building out its features with the community and testing everything and having people more obsessive than myself put building out profiles, although I've made some now, it provides a ton of value out of the box. And given how many of these lessons wound up getting backported to the RetroTINK 5X, overhauling that whole UI for it and adding features to it, the future will bring more and more features and finely tuned user profiles to this thing than we even have right now. And there's already a lot. I love it. It's hard not to. But what is hard to love is the price. Uh, at least for many people. The RetroTINK 4K costs 750 US dollars. That is hard to swallow for a lot of people. It couldn't have really been made cheaper. The FPGA in chip in this thing alone costs basically as much as the list price for the older RetroTINK 5X. This is truly the balls to the walls ultimate device. So rather than being mad about how much it costs, I wanna provide some alternatives, but first some perspective. The point of this scaler is to be the best for those with a lot of consoles, presumably, and with top tier displays. If you have a $1,000 plus 4K OLED TV, throwing crappy video signals at it means you kind of wasted your money for that TV. It's like buying a Ferrari and putting tires from Walmart on it and dollar store oil in it. It's a device for those who want the best and also for those who want it eventually, even if not now. It's difficult to imagine a scaler getting any better than this for the foreseeable future, especially with 8K having basically stalled out of relevance. Sure, an HDMI 2.1 upgrade would provide some tangible benefits, but I think that could make for a pro model or revised update to the 4K rather than needing a whole new device. So if you don't have a kick-ass TV to utilize BFI, HDR, and so on, 
you probably shouldn't be buying this anyway. So don't worry, you're not missing out on anything yet. Plus, considering the cost of most high-end CRTs nowadays, $750 for a scaler is not that insane. <laughs> for what I paid for my basically topped in, top end and professionally restored, mind you, but still my 24 inch BVM D24 CRT display, I could buy a like 55 to 65 inch 4K 120 Hertz OLED TV and basically two RetroTink 4Ks. That's why I'm even questioning even keeping the BVM around. It's smaller, 480i on it looks gross and it takes up a lot of space. I love it to death but the modern way is suddenly more compelling than ever before. Cost of this one aside, there's also a lot of great options on the market. The top priority to have is just to get a scaler at all so that you're giving your TV the best chance to do a lag-free scale. Make sure game mode is on too, of course. The older RetroTINK 2X products are exponentially cheaper and get you over that initial analog to digital and deinterlacing hurdle. Bob from RetroRGB just released a whole video showcasing why the 2X is still great today, even if not all of the available, not all the models are available anymore. RIP 2X multi-format. The GBSC AIO and the modded project for that and the RetroTINK 5X are both still fantastic scalers too. The GBSC AIO mod can put together can be put together for far, far cheaper than the RetroTINK 4K and the 5X is like half the price. These get you a 1080p or 1440p clean upscale with motion adaptive deinterlacing, real high quality stuff built in. And as mentioned, Mike has ported a ton of awesome features back to the 5X as he was developing the 4K. If you have a 4K OLED TV, it probably has great 1440p support as all the LG ones tend to, and is still a fantastic way to go here. Or if you just have a 1080p or 1440p monitor, these are gonna be all you need anyway. A high quality 1440p monitor and a RetroTINK 5X would be a wonderful experience that you'd never really have to think about again if that's kind of where you want to stop. Plus, if you're only using these HDMI modded consoles or with HDMI adapters, you can get the Pixel FX Morph and it'll probably do a good enough job. Pre-orders are up and we don't really know what it does yet or looks like yet, but probably for a lot cheaper. If you really want to save some money and are just patient, just hunt around locally on OfferUp, Craigslist, Facebook, Marketplace, and so on, and pick up virtually any old CRT TV or even a PC monitor, and you're going to have a great time. Consumer CRT TVs are perfect for playing older game consoles, and you won't be disappointed. Using PC monitors with something like the RetroTINK 2X and an HDMI to VGA converter, and you have basically a high-end PVM look, for cheap and easy. I have a whole playlist of videos declaring my love for CRT PC monitors and TVs linked in the description if that rabbit hole sounds more up your alley. Lag-free, crisp retro gaming is amazing. Plus, it doesn't have to be only retro. I play modern PC games on PC CRT monitors, and I even played my PS5 and Xbox Series X on my BVM in a video too. CRTs can do a lot. I've already covered the RetroTINK 5X in a dedicated video, so I wanted to focus on two other recent alternatives that, got, that I often get asked about, the 4K Gamer Pro and the M Classic. The 4K Gamer Pro takes 1080p only signals and sharply upscales them to 4K. It doesn't have any of the other features of the RetroTINK 4K, just scaling. This is great for Xbox 360, Xbox One, PS4, PS3, Nintendo Switch gamers who just want the added clarity and potential lower latency on their 4K TVs with these older consoles without having to scale up the older signal. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with 720p signals, which becomes a problem for a ton of PlayStation 3 and Wii U games and a lot of other HDMI devices like the GBA consoleizer and such. In my review, linked below, I found it to do a great job at keeping the Nintendo Switch looking clearer on my 4K TV, and I quite preferred it to the native video input for my Switch and to the LG CX's AI super resolution feature and it has a few different sharpening modes as well. For around $218, it's a much cheaper option than the RetroTINK 4K. If you already have a 1080p scaler, like the RetroTINK 5X or FrameMeister, and you want to combine their forces, or simply to, you want to improve the experience of your older HD consoles, or the PS2 with the RetroJet on your 4K panel. But it doesn't help with retro games directly. But it does pass through those non-1080p signals directly to your TV if you're playing something higher resolution, so you at least don't have to hot swap cables should you need to run something in 1440p or 4K, which is pretty cool. The M Classic, on the other hand, takes 480p, 720p, and 1080p signals and outputs them to 1080p. Technically, if you're on a 1440p monitor, which is great and absolutely worth considering if you're playing on one, it will output 1440p. But on a 4K TV, even with great 1440p support, it still seems to lock to 1080p. It grabs whatever the default EDID or display identifier is for that display. 
The device adds some anti-aliasing smoothing to Jaggies on the scaling, which seems invisible to most people with 1080p sources like Nintendo Switch, which is why most people were calling it snake oil when it released, and I never really ended up covering it. Instead, M Classic works better as resolution gets lower, providing some benefit to 720p signals, making it great to pair with PS2 and PS3 games, and more to 480p games, such as any number of HDMI mods or adapters for retro consoles. The type of scaling being done here is intentionally more blurry than, say, integer upscaling focus of devices like the RetroTINK, uh, it won't work great for pixel art games at all. But for early 3D consoles, it may be preferred for th to get the look that you want on your 4K TV. Or you could get real funky and go from the M Classic to the 4K Gamer Pro. I, I, I don't know. I like that these options are available, and if you, you're after cheaper ways to get your signal scaled better for your TV, these are solid options but I'm not hugely sold on them myself. For what it's worth, the M Classic also makes audio cut out constantly on my TV once it's in the chain. Don't know what's up with that. The M Classic will read the default EDID from the RetroTINK as 720p and send 720p to the RetroTINK 4K, so you're not getting the full scaling benefit of that, but eh. The 4K Gamer Pro stays connected to my Switch dock 100% of the time at our bedroom TV, but I do not really use the M Classic personally. I'm pointing to videos from Digital Foundry and My Life in Gaming on the M Classic for deeper dives there. Capture and streaming with the RetroTINK 4K is simple, as long as you're using the simple modes. The standard output is 4K 60Hz, so any card with 4K pass-through can be used here. If you want to capture a native 4K, you're looking at either last-gen PCIe cards like the Avermedia Live Gamer 4K and Live Gamer Duo, or the Elgato 8 4K 60 Pro, or the Magewell 4K Pro Capture HDMI cards, or the Blackmagic Decklink Quad HDMI. If you want 4K capture over USB, you're looking at the new generation of cards, which we're only just getting the first looks at. Avermedia's new Live Gamer Ultra 2.1 or the upcoming Elgato 4K X. There's also the Asus one coming and a couple others. Or if you happen to have Thunderbolt 3, but you're not on an Apple Silicon Mac, the Evermedia Live Gamer Bolt will do you good here too. If you're wanting to record comparisons and pixel peep, then you'll want to capture in the 444 color space that doesn't subsample any colors. Scaling up traditional 420 footage that most capture cards would capture can result in scaling artifacts and ringing that do not represent what you're trying to show. Your options for this are only PCIe options. The Evermedia Live Gamer 4K, Elgato 4K 60 Pro, Magewell 4K Pro Capture HDMI, Blackmagic Jacklink Quad. I believe Elgato's upcoming 4K Pro will also do this, but it's not out yet, so I can't fully speak on it. The USB, Live Gamer Ultra 2.1, and the upcoming 4K X will not be able to do this due to USB bandwidth. And Avermedia's Live Gamer 4K 2.1, their PCIe card coming out soon, according to their official specs, seems to not officially support the format either. <sighs> But you don't need 444 for normal video making or live streaming, as streaming must be done in 420, usually in V12 and OBS anyway, and videos are all clamped down to 420 on YouTube. Even Blu-rays are still delivered in 420. Unlike the RetroTINK 5X, the output mode of the RetroTINK 4K is primarily 16x9, with black filling whatever is left of the frame from the scaling. This makes sense, as all kinds of aspect ratios and scaling options are available, and your output won't always be true 4x3. Capture is made easier by this, as you don't have to worry about your capture card supporting the oddball 4x3 format, such as the 5X's launch 1440p mode. Also, you don't have to worry about weird frame rate capture options, as the frame buffer mode on the RetroTINK 4K keeps all of your signals normalized to 60Hz. That works fine with capture. All my captures here were done with the Magewell Pro Capture Dual HDMI 4K Plus LT, and one of the upcoming Elgato cards that I can't really talk about. If you do want to capture the native refresh rate using the gin lock or frame lock modes out of the RetroTINK 4K, you're going to most likely either need Magewell or the Elgato 4K60 Pro or Avermedia Live Gamer 4K. Black Magic cards do not tolerate non-standard formats, and most of the other cards are not going to be flexible enough, but your mileage may vary entirely based on this. You want something with VRR support, as you'll need to toggle that on, which makes Elgato kind of the best bet here, and then, or Magewell. So. Uh, good luck with that one. I have not had great results with the 70 hertz output, but I know other people who have. Honestly, the RetroTINK 4K has kind of put me in a bit of a detached state here. This thing is truly incredible, no doubt about it, but I'm stuck here looking at all the time and effort I put into my retro game streaming setup that always has routing issues preventing me from just picking it up and going, despite that being the point of it. it, it it's really making me think I wasted my time and my money. I get the feeling that this holiday break means a pretty big shift for the layout of my studio now. Times, they are a-changing.
Ever since 2017 sparked a resurgence in retro development with projects like the GCHD, the snowball has not stopped. We are truly living in a retro renaissance of sorts. Every year, more people learn about the benefits of CRT gaming and crazy stuff like scalers like this, HDMI mods, FPGA clone systems, ODE mods, all of those things become better and more widely available. There's never been a better time to jump in. Just prepare your wallet. Gaming is a fun, leisurely hobby. Don't go into debt just to play video games. Take your time, things will only get better over time, and it will be worth the wait in the long run. And wait you shall, as the RetroTINK 4K sold out in under an hour, which, while demand was clearly high from anyone who knew anything about it, I don't think anyone really expected this to happen, and it really, it even took down Mike's Wix site, which uses AWS, which was completely mind-blowing. Do not worry, though, you will not have to wait long. A new batch will be coming in January, so just hang tight. You're not missing out. These aren't going anywhere. This isn't an analog product. You're still going to get to use it. Don't worry. But it, clearly, it sold well. This is amazing. And clearly, the $750 price point did not ruin the retro scene or turn that many people off or jump the shark, as all the people in the crazy forums and Facebook groups keep saying. Clearly, this is what people wanted. I'm pretty stoked with the already growing ecosystems of RetroTINK 4K accessories, such as Todd Gill over at RetroFrog. He has a vertical stand that actually works with mine that is pretty awesome and is going to be crucial in my setup. Uh, the people over at Laser Bear Industries have a wall mount and a knock to a fan mod. If you're worried about keeping it cool enough and want to mount it on your wall, they have stuff like that. Jay Chin just released a slim profile SCART connector that runs to VGA so that he, you can use with all of his VGA output mods for consoles so that you can use a more solid connector. And then Kyoder Industries just released a locking SCART connector so you don't have to worry about it getting pulled loose. And the RetroTINK 4K actually has locking spots in there for it to screw right into. So you have so many options. Check this video right here to check out the previous scaler, the RetroTINK 5X, and how I feel about it and see how it compares to this one. Or check this video over here to learn about the FPGA clone consoles, specifically the analog pocket, and my experiences with it so far. Be sure to go check out my main channel, Epos Vox, for more streaming tutorials, stream guides, and more hardcore technical coverage. And remember to be kind. Rewind.